Good morning, everyone. My name is Jose Aranda. I work at the library at Doña Ana Community College, and I coordinate uh, this year's uh, Latinx Hispanic Heritage Month program. And this is uh, the second program in the month list of activities. Uh, the month started September 15th, which was last Wednesday. And it goes on through October 15th. We have uh, a program with uh, several presentations, this being one of them. Um, and we also will have a Gran Fiesta on the 13th, October 13th, which is also a Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. at the East Mesa campus patio for music, dancing, and fun. Um, last week when we started, NMSU, our partner, uh, had two events on their campus, uh, Salsa Tasting and Salsa Zumba Instruction. So uh, that's what kicked it off. And uh, today we have my presentation on Hispanic history is American history. So um, the purpose of this presentation is to highlight the similarities and the history between cultures and countries that are not always easily uh, distinguished and uh, creates this appearance of, of uh, an American culture that uh, is larger, larger than the United States or any one country. Uh, so I will keep it brief under 30 minutes and um, I hope you uh, got a copy of our program and will attend the other programs that are scheduled as well. So without further ado, let us begin. And I am, pause, no, I am recording, okay. In this picture, we have uh, two eagles. For those of you that do not know, of course, the American eagle, bald eagle, is the eagle on the left. And that is very symbolic of the United States. But Mexico also, and there could be other countries. Uh, I, I don't claim to be an expert, but I know Mexico has and uses the, the other eagle, the eagle on the right, the brown colored eagle, and it too is on their national flag. So right off the bat, we have this similarity, right, of the use of this uh, predatory bird and uh, symbolism uh, for at least these two countries, there may be others, uh, I don't know, but I thought this would be a nice segue into the discussion of, you know, it's not all black and white. There is a lot of gray area, there's a lot of middle ground, there's a lot of history behind the names of things, the places of things, the people. It's a shared history is what I'd like to call it. So hopefully we can uh, learn more about this uh, in the next 30 minutes. The flag on the left-hand side here is the oldest that I was able to find on Google, uh, symbolic of, uh, of course, our 13 colonies. But apparently the website that I found a picture from said that this is actually uh, a, a replica of the oldest known flag for the United States. So let us speak. Think back to your, I don't know, fifth grade, sixth grade geography, maybe seventh, eighth grade, or even high school, geography and history. We tend to use America to identify the United States. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I recently heard from one expert uh, that said, well, it's United States is the only country that uses the word America in its title. You know, it's the United States of America. But I don't think that's correct. Uh, Mexico uses the exact same phrase. Estados Unidos de América. No, Estados Unidos Mexicanos de América. The only difference is that they had the Mexico, the United States of Mexico, of America. So uh, we need to we need to have a global perspective uh, 
when addressing America and be specific when we, what we mean when we say it. Uh, a little history, you know, I have there some information about Amerigo Vespucci. Some of you may remember that name. Uh, he is the one credited for naming this side of the world. Remember, uh, Europeans were trying to find a route to Asia because they were getting tired of having to pay taxes and just the length that it took to cross over land. Uh, they wanted to explore it going uh, west, and uh, that's how they discovered America, both North, Central, and South America. It is two continents, uh, maybe even three regions. So let's keep that in perspective uh, to not be so selfish with the word America. It means both continents, everyone on this side of the world. Um, and if you look at our histories of Native Americans and European explorations, for example, uh, there's a lot of shared similarities. Uh, so I wanted to start off with this uh, topic of what does America mean? So in essence, we're all Americans, those of us that live on this side of the world, technically. <clears throat> Beautiful picture of, uh, I think it's a hotel in Santa Fe. There's a battle sometimes, I think, confusing people about what is the oldest city. Um, and the next slide will show the oldest uh, city and that is St. Augustine in Florida, a Spanish uh, colony and, and fort. But Santa Fe is, is quite old as well, right? Uh, established in 1610. Those of you that have taken New Mexico history or are from New Mexico probably know this already. Uh, the oldest state capital in the US is Santa Fe in New Mexico. Whereas St. Augustine was the original uh, continuously inhabited European settlement, established settlement in what is now considered the United States of America. Remember, Florida once was owned or controlled by Spain. So, um, you know, both these cities predate Plymouth Rock. So think about that for a second. You know, we hear about the pilgrims and, and Plymouth Rock and Thanksgiving and, and these two places already were existing. Uh, so, Something to chew on. Uh, we have archi not architectural, archaeological and, and hieroglyphic uh, evidence throughout the Southwest, but specifically in New Mexico, about cultures and natives living here for thousands of years. Okay, we like to say how the dinosaurs once roamed these places well. Let's not forget about the peoples that lived. I'm not saying that lived during that time, but then afterwards lived. Uh, so I think it's important when considering Hispanic history, US history, Mexico history, the Southwest, the state of New Mexico, it could all be summarized with, you know, let, let's think pandemic, let's think global, let's think big picture here. So we need to give credit and um, I think uh, identify the, um, these ancient cultures that once, once lived in these areas. For those of you that have traveled on I-10 uh, through Arizona, let's say heading west to San Diego, and then right there where it cuts off to go north to Phoenix, and then you continue on on I-8, you pass uh, Casa Grande. And it uh, literally means big house in Spanish, but it also is an archeological dwelling that goes back, if not thousands of years. So kind of indicative of what I'm trying to explain here with these ancient cultures that once lived in this area. Just some little um, trivial information, you know, Spanish is the second most spoken language. I'm sorry, I didn't capitalize the US, the United States, but it's the second most spoken language in the US. Uh, Hispanics are known for their family values, particularly their extended 
families and their structures uh, and uh, their continuous ties to their mother countries. Whereas other, I think in, in contrast, whereas other, um, other countries, other immigrants from other countries, you know, Italy, uh, Germany, what have you, right? Uh, immigrants that have migrated to the United States throughout its history that have come from other countries. Uh, there tends to be by the second, third generation, generation a loss of that connectivity. Uh, not always, and of course, if they still have family there, that will continue. Uh, but with that, when that happens, you start losing the language, you start losing a lot of the traditional, whereas Hispanics, for a lot of reasons, right? Proximity, but they, they just tend to do a, a, a good job at keeping their family values, at keeping their language, and their ties to the other country. So that could, that could help explain some things. Music and food. Uh, two things, just two cultural icons from the Hispanic community that are very popular in American society, United States. And uh, in fact, I think salsa beat ketchup as the number one condiment. Uh, if not recently, I remember hearing about that in the past. And those of us who live in the Southwest, of course, always have that salsa in the fridge ready to go. Uh, another thing that uh, I think I find interesting, you know, if you, if, if you read, if you listen, to, if you acknowledge the names of a lot of these big cities, you know, have Spanish names, right? Los Angeles, Santa Fe, Presidio, Texas, San Antonio, San Diego, Monterey, California. The list goes on, right? Florida has a lot of them too. Uh, the list could have continued. I put et cetera there. So it kind of gives you an indication that, you know, there is some history there uh, that predates perhaps what we may have thought. Uh, in other words, because of the natives that existed here and the combustibility of the European explorations, uh, there's a lot of meshing of, of those histories. And I think it's beautiful because it adds color and, it, it, and I hope it brings more people together than it does separate, right? Uh, so anyways, those are my two little cents for this slide there. Uh, this, I'm sorry, this, this uh, slide may be more applicable, applicable to uh, another presentation that I will, will, that I will be doing on uh, Native Americans. But nonetheless, I mentioned the Mogollon, Mogollon culture. There on the left-hand side, um, we're talking uh, 200 BC, or no, I'm sorry, 200 CE, Common Era, uh, a long time ago. 2,000 years ago. This is a map of what experts believe uh, where the Mogollon culture lived and, and, and traveled. So um, Casa Grandes, if you look, we see where, yeah, you should see it right there. It has a, a, a red triangle, Casa Grande, uh, the Hilla Cliff dwellings. I mean, we have a lot of archeological sites in the Southwest that prove uh, that uh, these people lived and that uh, there was there was a culture and a history a long time ago. So I think it's uh, worth mentioning these. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, the Mogollon culture. This is just a snapshot. We just had the census last year. And I have a big green arrow there indicating that, you know, of all the population in the United States, almost 19% is considered Hispanic or Latino. Um, that's almost one fifth, and projections are, are are claiming that this will only continue. Uh, so, if you're interested, check out the census website. Just Google it, and then you could narrow the information down to cities, counties, states, whatever, uh, and you can uh, research for yourself uh, what the current and the latest numbers are. Uh, this is just an overview. Of, of the entire nation, national population. It being Hispanic Latino Heritage Month, there are lots of displays and um, websites that house 
lot of information. I tried to give you a snapshot of some of some of, of, some of them, but um, I'm so I'm just going to run quickly through them because there are a lot of them, and I did not get an exhaustive list, of course. And so this one's from the National Museum of American History, and they have a Latino. They have a bearing center that is focusing on Latino history, and there is a website. And they have a lot of programs and events coming up. Some you can view from your computer or, or mobile device, or if you're looking to be in a town that is celebrating, maybe they too will have um, events uh, near where you live. But they also have links here to exhibitions and collections and other things that I think are worth checking out. The National Museum of American History. This one's from the Smithsonian, uh, also affiliated and associated with uh, the other museum. You know, sports and music. I failed to mention sports, but you know, if you watch uh, baseball, you know that there are a lot of Latino Hispanic players, and uh, you know, America, United States exported exported this sport. And it's just very popular in, in many Latin American countries, uh, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, the list goes on, right? Mexico. So if you're interested, check out uh, this exhibition from the Smithsonian. Uh, the lady on the bottom, uh, Celia Cruz, a very, if not the most popular Cuban salsa singer. Um, she died, I think, 12, 13 years ago, something like that. No. 17, 18 years ago. Um, very popular, well-loved lady. And uh, her music still lives on. Azúcar uh, is a famous song that she sang. And so it's the name of this exhibition for her. More information about the baseball. I found it very interesting that uh, this uh, museum went into further uh, about the actual players. And, and they have a play on word here, playboard. So more information for those that are interested in, in, in um, learning more about the sport. I think it would be an interesting angle for one to concentrate just on the sport itself and see what kinds of um, similarities and, and influences and effects have resulted, let's say in the last 100 years, 50 years even. Uh, I think that would be an interesting take on, on a history like this, uh, just if you take it from the perspective of the sport of baseball. And there's another picture of that exhibition. And they also have this uh, Many Voices, One Nation. Uh, on the left-hand side, if you see there, there's uh, somewhat of a timeline there that if you click on it, it will then produce for you uh, scenarios and, and, and uh, biographies and other information, historical information about the people that have lived throughout the decades, throughout the centuries in this country. And so you can go back and, and explore some of those names. I like the title, Many Voices, One Nation. Um, the people of North America came from many cultures and some of them were even already here. And with the Treaty of Guadalupe of 1848, with the changing of the international border for the United States and Mexico, many people found themselves living in a new country. So uh, some things to think about. I mentioned food, right? Mexican food is very popular uh, throughout the world, if not throughout the United States, if not the world. Uh, so I like how in this uh, exhibition, they. Uh, go into the Mexican food revolution, the history with the migrants that brought over. There you have some uh, pictures of tortilla making in San Antonio, Texas. I know a lot of you love to eat just like I do tortillas and beans and chili. And, and so um, I know it's morning and some of us have not eaten breakfast. Uh, so I apologize if this slide makes you hungry, but through food, we exchange culture and our history. So it is important to think about that uh, and to include in this presentation, the Mexican food revolution. And I think this is the last one. This is just an example of a biography that this museum has uh, available. 
This one's called Not Lost in Translation, The Life of Clotilde Arias. Uh, so you could explore biographies and just, uh, you know, uh, satisfy your curiosity of who some of these people may have been historically that we just don't hear about, you know. That's what I like about having history months, right? Black history, women's history, Hispanic history is that we get to hopefully focus at least during those times and learn about these unknown people in our history that, that you'd be surprised what they did, what they accomplished and, and what they represent and what they all mean. So this is just an example of one. I didn't pick this person at all for any other reason than to just demonstrate to you that uh, this, this museum has this exhibit and gallery available for you to explore. Again, the, this is another Smithsonian uh, museum and exhibition. It gives you a little bit of information about the National Museum of the American Latino. Let me just read that for you. For centuries, diverse Latino communities have played foundational roles in building the United States and shaping its national culture. The rich histories and legacies predate the nation's establishment. They are deeply rooted in this country's pursuit of democracy, freedom, multiculturalism and economic opportunity. Their stories and perspectives deepen our understanding of the United States and what it means to be American. So in a nutshell, uh, what I've been trying to say, but not as elegantly as the Smithsonian Latino Center. Um, this is from a very reputable source, particularly in Chicano history or Mexican-American history or even Southwest history. Uh, Rodolfo Acuna uh, is the author, and I think now it's on the eighth, if not 10th edition. It's called Occupied America. Um, and here are just a couple quotes that I, uh, that I took from it. By the end of the 18th century, New Mexico society was well-rooted. Only 68 of some 16,000 persons had been born outside of New Mexico. Two were from Spain. So this notion of people living here and not going back. Uh oh, excuse me, that's my light. And not going back. They considered this home, they established themselves, they formed families and had children. And so there were generations and generations already established, at least in New Mexico, and I'm sure in other places in the Southwest. Uh, I think this slide would be more appropriate for uh, um, my other presentation, but you know, I'm not from New Mexico, but when I moved here, I noticed a lot of the last names were kind of very common here. The Archuletas, the Armijos, you know, the list goes on, right? And we have streets. At least here in Las Cruces, New Mexico, we have streets named after these people. We have monuments, we have places, and probably throughout New Mexico and, and Southwest, you may think. But uh, there is history of, of some of these original colonists that came uh, either through Spain or through Mexico, which was considered Spain back then. So again, a lot of history in, in embedded in, in, in the Southwest. Um, one of the things I learned when I moved here 16 years ago were that, you know, there's some people that can trace their lineage back to these original settlers, you know, uh, the Spanish uh, colonists, as well as the Native Americans. So rich history. I threw in the old Spanish trail um, because I wanted to establish this notion that there were already people living here. There were already towns set up and families and, and agriculture and, and what have you, right? Before the colonists of Spain and before it became a territory. And then after that, part of the United States. Uh, there was this trail called the Old Spanish Trail. And, you know, it connected communities for trading, right? Uh, and, and this goes uh, back to the 16th century uh, that were if not started by the Native Americans, uh, enforced by the Spanish explorers. So uh, here's a picture, a map of that old Spanish trail. It connected primarily the Northern part of New Mexico and what we call the Four Corners area. 
um, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico. It's the Four Corners area. But then it also leads into Nevada and California. Uh, so with these um, roads, you have connectivity, right? Those of us in New Mexico and even Mexico know about the Camino Real, uh, the great road from Mexico City that connects to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and how for centuries that was a lifeline for a lot of things, of course, commercial, but other, other means too, migration, family. And, and so here's another one, not as great perhaps, but still indicative of this, this uh, traveling and, and sharing amongst people. Uh, so I think it highlights the importance of, of keeping this in mind. It was not a blank slate. Uh, it, it has its history. And, and so that's what I'm trying to paint here for you. And I'm closing in on the presentation. Uh, I think this presentation could be taken way further than what I've done. I did not mean to get into any deep analysis, but that's totally possible. Uh, so I just wanted to give a brief overview, uh, trying to give um, some trivial, but also some, some analytical uh, things to consider that we may not have thought about before or that we should uh, give some time now. So I'm, as I'm wrapping up the presentation, I, I threw in this slide because I wanted to, you know, again, paint the picture that, you know, there, Spain was, was involved in a lot of other states and cities history. And so this is taken from a website. The next three slides are from the same website that uh, explain how some state flags and or their shields had Spanish influence. Spain, the colony of Spain, uh, had some kind of influence. And uh, when I used to live in Florida, I learned about that, um, but also from California and now in New Mexico. But there are others, uh, Alabama, Arizona, Montana, New Mexico, the city of LA, Texas's shield, Puerto Rico, Florida, they all have Spanish influences. And so if you're curious, if you're interested, look and research some of this. I think it'd be neat. One example I do want to highlight, though, is Pensacola. This Florida city is known as the city of five flags because at one at various times throughout its history, five different national governments had control over the city throughout its long history. So they honored all of them in creating this unique flag. And I think that's really cool. I think that is indicative of being uh, appreciated, appreciative of one's own history and heritage and not trying to exclude, but yet include them all. So it may not be as pretty as the other flags, but I like how at least their intent is, is inclusive, right? Uh, flags that mixes them all. They're all a mixture of all the flags. And the last slide here <clears throat> is uh, the dollar sign. Did you know the dollar sign came from Spain? The symbol of the pillars of Hercules was first used by the king of Spain. And it then became the, what we now consider the international symbol, at least for the U.S. currency. I could, I don't know about everything else, but we all know about the mighty dollar sign, right? It came from here. So... I just think it's, it's, it's rich when we learn about these things and we give credit on, 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 on the resources and, and the sources that, that originated them. You know, a lot of times we think one thing and then we find out differently. So I ask you to be open-minded. Um, many Hispanics and Latinos in the United States obviously consider themselves American, but there's also more history to uncover and uh, keeping an open-mindedness, I think will do anything, will do uh, nothing but improve our relations. And also hopefully as a historian help reach the young and teach them 
that they may find their identity somewhere along some of these things that we that we uncover. So I hope this presentation was uh, worth your time. I hope you uh, follow our program, contact us for all that information. It's on our website as well, but the next presentation will be next Monday. Uh, I'm giving it and it is on uh, interesting facts of South America. Thank you all for joining us. I appreciate it.